Good morning, I am Pete, also known as Risk for Rewards over on Twitter. And today we are here to talk Royal Ascot. I'm going to keep it as short as possible. Day three, I know this is coming out late, so my selections are already up, but I'll talk through them because I know it makes life a lot easier. Day four, I'm going to go into quite a bit of depth. I've had a really good look at day four. Quite a few I fancy, fairly strong nap. So I have time stamped along the bottom of the video so you can skip through. If you're watching this at whatever point, you can just click to whatever race it is you want. If you're sat at work and you don't have time to sit there and watch a whole video, just click to whichever part it is you want. I will try and make it as clear as possible with what selections I've got, um, but also I'm here just to talk about the racing and to give people a little bit of insight for those who may not have time or may not watch too much racing. So Royal Ascot, first two days have been cracking, really good. Um, enjoyable cannot believe the weather i mean after having rain for so long it was it's got to be massive odds against and obviously we have got proper sunshine we're talking over 20 degrees today people who are there thursday friday they are going to have it off and you get the best racing you get i'm not saying you don't get hard luck stories but you get fair racing um this isn't cheltenham not going to stand here and say oh this is cheltenham they're nothing alike people stop comparing them the horses you're looking at here they've had two or three runs and stuff don't be coming into this and expecting to be going home with fortunes because you've been plotting out for 12 months just enjoy it for what it is change your stakes do whatever you need to do. You're going to back more losers than you are winners, but hopefully it will come out and you'll enjoy the week anyway. Anyway, let's get to the racing because I don't want to waffle on. So I am recording this at 10.50 on Thursday morning. So prices are will be as of then. Um, and I've already put some up, but I will go through. And we're going to try and cover Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturday is very brief because the decks are just coming through. So I'll probably check them now as I'm live online with yourselves. So Thursday. So for anyone time stamping, this is Thursday Royal Ascot, day three. So we're on to the Norfolk Stakes. And I'm not going to beat about the bush. This does look not... A, I don't want to over exaggerate. At the end of the day, we've seen what happens with short price favourites. We're having big price favourites, uh, big priced horses win these two year old races. The reason is for that is because often the best horse matures later in the season. Richard Hannon made a very strong point with it that often he doesn't send his best two year olds to Royal Ascot because they're not ready yet. So they may have had a run or two runs, but they get better as the season goes on. And you often see that with Aidan O'Brien. At the same time, the difference with Aidan O'Brien is Royal Ascot is his cash ticket. They love to send their horses here, work out who are the best, the River Tibers, the Little Big Bears. They come here, they get the job done. So it's been no secret all week that if there was going to be one for Aidan O'Brien in all the two-year-old races, it looked to be Whistle Jacket. The form didn't really get boosted from his debut run when finishing behind um, Coward of the County. Coward of the County was compromised in the Coventry and did well staying on. But at the same time, you would have liked the horse to come on in the first three to have a really strong form boost. Um, dropped back to the five furlongs. Whistle Jacket, though, just like, uh, was it Half Brother? I'll just check that to Little Big Brother. In fact, I'm not going to check that, but is a relation to Little Big Bear. Dropped back to five furlongs and beat Arizona Blaze. Arizona Blaze then went on to beat the other Aiden O'Brien Hot Pot, Camilla Pizarro, fairly comfortably. Um, and that made Whistle Jacket's form look red hot. As far as it goes in two-year-old races, the form looks as strong as it can be. However, we're looking at a race where he's only had two runs and he's 11 to 8. I put him up at 6 to 4, maybe 7 to 4, something like that. You're probably getting, I'm looking at the market now, he's about 11 to 8, 6 to 4. Yeah, you pay your money and you take your chance. I've got no negatives against him. Are there better horses in here? We don't know because I'm looking down through. I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine last time out winners. But do I think he's got a favourites chance? Yeah, I do. And I do think he's one of the, the afraid no Brian. They have made no secret about him being their best one of the week. Um, the other selection was shareholder. I put this up prior to him running um, and I put him up after him running. Uh, so he was 20 to 1 before, 14 to 1 after, um, and he was 4 to 1 a few days ago, and now he's out to 10 to 1. So you're not losing anything if you get the 10 to 1, because you, I haven't gained an all, well, I obviously I have if I've took 20s, but you get you get my point. You can probably get him on the exchange even bigger than that. Shareholder, for me, is a, a boom or bust. The, the way he ran last time out, he should, had no right to win over. Beverly's a really sharp, it was more cl close to a four furlongs and five furlongs. He fell up the stall. He missed a break. He had to come wide. He raced in snatches. He, s he began to settle. He then loomed up very large, like monstrous. And then when he hit the front, he didn't really know what to do. And James Doyle just pushed him out to see at home. James Doyle's made the choice. Obviously, he would have had the choice of um, him or Asterius. And he's chosen shareholder. 
shareholder gave me aspects of the Lady Aurelia vibes, the way he just loomed up alongside and like monstrous. He's a big old horse, um, but he didn't give me the Lady Aurelia vibes in the finish. For me, shareholder, I think the way they talk about him, we know Carl Burke. Carl Burke obviously had a two-year-old winner yesterday. The way they talk about him is just very, very strong, well thought of. Wathnam purchase. I just think if he gets if he gets out on terms and he looms up the way he did on the bridle last time, like I could easily see him doing the Lady Aurelia like kick and we see how good he is. But at the same time, I could easily see him falling out the back of the screen. So for me, obviously, they're my two selections. I definitely would not be forgetting about Shareholder. I like Shareholder as much as I like Whistle Jacket, and obviously they're very different prices. Um, so for me, I'm hoping I at least land one of them. Right, on to the King George stakes. So Fr French Duke has been well-backed. Well, not well-backed, probably about eights or nines yesterday overnight. I will tell you, obviously, I don't put all these things up on Twitter because it's pointless. People are like, oh, info horses. I have had a fairly strong word from someone in the very yard that they do like this horse um, and, they and they do expect it to go close. That was sent to me about nine to one. But at the same time, I don't play my horses at this level um, based on information or sources of who's this horse or that horse. I will have a saver on him. So if what I mean by that for anyone who's new to racing or whatever is say I was having two pound on one horse, two pound on another horse, you could have 50p on French Duke at say eight to one and that would cover your whole stake so you don't lose money. But I do have two selections and my main selection that I've been quite strong on for some time is I go on and on and on about the London Gold Cup form. I think it's the best handicap of the season, of early season. Um, and that was won by King's Gambit who runs later on today. The horse that finished second there was Ponyros. So Ponyros travelled like an absolute monster and was travelling arguably better than King's Gambit. Um, but when push come to shove, I don't know whether it was down to greenness or because obviously that was fourth run, but at the same time, it was only second run of the season. Sometimes they take long to grow up. Um, he stayed on rather than going away from them. He stayed on, but he stayed on in what I think is going to be a very, very strong handicap. He stayed on in, ahead of Chantilly, Persica, into battle. The only horse that could pass him was King's Gambit. And he was only getting five pounds from that horse. So in fourth that day was Persica, who was staying on. Persica then stayed on that same mark and went in and bolted up at Epsom. So Persica went from 92 up to a mark of 101. Persica would have been top of my list for this, along with Ponyros. Those two would have been the selections. The downside for Persica is the fact that Persica, because of bolting up last time, has been whacked up nine pounds. And for me, could he improve again? Yeah, he could. But at the same time, a lot of the time, if you're going to try and win a big competitive race as good as this, you only have one go at it. And you get one big whack and then and then that's you. Um, so Pony Ross only got £4 for that run. I think £4 is fair. Drawn in the right place. Drawn high, 14 a high draw is, is good for this uh, race. Um, you, you don't want to be in the, in the bottom 10. I haven't got the stats to hand, but you don't want to be in the bottom 10. Um, the race before with Harper's Ferry was strong form but I just I look at that London Gold Cup form only put up four pounds when you've got the likes of obviously Persica Frank in the form are now up nine pounds higher from that run um, obviously Chantilly I'm here talking about one horse Chantilly finished third coming from a wide draw had to do plenty beforehand so you could easily make a case for him to go close and to obviously for him to even beat Poneros the downside for Chantilly is Chantilly is drawn lower, so it makes it trickier. All the horses come in from the side and you do get stuck in pockets. I do expect the fact that he went forward last time, Chantilly will probably go forward again. And if they let Ryan Moore have too much rope, it wouldn't surprise me if he does the damage. He's only up £3, so he's £1 better off with Poniros. Um, the negative for him is, as I was saying earlier about the fact that you normally only get that one big rise and then that's you, is that uh, Chantilly won a leopard's town handicap the start of the season off 85 he's now running off 13 pound higher and he's running off obviously three pound higher of last time out whereas i just believe that poniros could have that opportunity to have the the extra so chantilly is a huge danger the other selection is gilded water so gilded water for the same connections as last year um tom marquan and william hadigas they won this with desert hero going back to the handicap the newbury handicap that i mentioned earlier the gold cup Desert Hero was sent off the 4-1 to one favourite that day, completely bombed, didn't enjoy the track, um, bounced back and then won this race. So here we've got Gilded Water. Gilded Water absolutely hacked up last time at Chepstow over 10 furlongs. So the fact that the trainer knows what it takes to win this, he's targeted this race. Same connections, running for the king this time. Um, put in on a handicap mark of 92, having ran to an RPR of 95 last time out. 
it, you're absolutely guessing whether that's good or bad. You, as in the handicapper will have just took a swipe and hoped. The negative for him is just like Chantilly is the fact that he's drawn low. He's drawn on stall six, not a stall that I like to see. But a flick through, I'm not saying, when I say stall six, like the, over the last five, you had Desert Heroes in 21, Secret State eight, Surefire 17, Huckham 4, South Pacific 8. So you have had three of the last five all drawn below 10. But it's just, it depends on the type of horse and how they get out. Like, as I said, for Chantilly, it's probably not going to be a problem because he's going to get out and move across. I just worry about him already being £13 higher than his last win. Whereas Gilded Water, the handicapper's got no idea how good this, this horse is. He could be, have an easy £10 in hand. So they're my two for that race. Gilded Water, and I really, really like Poneros. Poneros would be the one selection if choosing over the two. And I expect him to come there travelling like a good thing, hopefully. Down the outside, David Egan on the schnaff. It's just how much he finds against the others. This will be a messy race. It gets messy in the finish and you, you will get hard luck stories. And a saver on French Duke, as mentioned. On to the 345. The 345 is the Ribblesdale Stakes. Um, this I'm looking through. I've just seen Diamond Reigns actually drifted. So Diamond Reigns actually 2-1. to one. Actually a fair price now, I'd say, um, based on form. My issue with Diamond Rain is one, because obviously that's a short enough price in a race where you've got loads of unexposed fillies and mares. Two is the difference in trainer. So Charlie Appleby is a trainer who gets his horses hot. So what I mean by that is they often will be on debut. They might be at 90, 95%, improve for the next time, 100%. And, and they it's how long he can keep them going at that red hot form. Whereas you'll get other trainers like John Gosden, they know Brian. First run, just let them see what they find. Second run, grow and grow and grow. And they grow into the race and they grow into form. And as the season ends, you'll get horses um, that, that mature and they end up being group one horses whereas if in my opinion I think a lot of Charlie Appleby's horses the way they train if they're getting their group ones it'll be the early start of the season at the same time this is only three runs in and this could be the perfect time to catch him um, he was sent off uh, three to one in a race where Ciola started six to four and ended up drifting out to three to one for John Gosden Ciola was well beaten three and a half lengths and Diamond Rain did it well on the day absolutely nothing I could take the favourite on with um, I very the sexy horse of the race and two to one is probably fair now Kalpana has the form in the book um, having finished behind friendly soul who I was surprised not to see here um, and Kalpana has been well back from the four to five to one for me I want to just take a few swings at this as I've said different fillies and mares are very unpredictable so you get horses in the past where they'll um they just mature at different different speeds and they, they can turn up on different days and they're unpredictable. I'm not saying that's like females in real life, but sometimes you can be unpredictable. So so for me, do I do I think the front two have it on what we've seen so far? Yes, 100 percent. But could I see the likes of Danielle, Ciola, um, Lava Stream, Rubies are Red? Could I see them being the horses to follow later in the season? Yes, I could. So the negative for Danielle, so I've got three selections in this race. I've gone three win only, small selections. All of them would pay higher than obviously back in the favour if any of them were to get the job done. Danielle reminds me um, a bit like the Connections had the horse called Starcatcher that won this in the past. Starcatcher came here, didn't have particularly the strongest form going into the race, had been beaten, um, but matured for the day. And as I said, had given been given time. I think a lot of Gosling horses, it's almost like when it was raining, we had a poor um, slow start to the winter. He's just kept them all back, just said, we're not going to run yet because they've been slow when they first come out. This horse beaten on debut by winter snowfall, then bolted up by 12 lengths and everyone's eyes popped out and was into about five to one for the Oaks, I believe. Um, and then disappointed uh, last time out when beaten by you got to me. Um, was short in the market on the day started about five to four but sent off two to one the vibes weren't that strong John Gosden said this week that this horse wants softer ground um, but the thing is he would have known exactly what the ground's going to be and he's made the decision to run her so and she's also the, the choice of Kieran Schumacher so I'm happy to give her a roll of the dice maybe it'll be later in the season when we see how good she is the one that was very interested in was Ciola like Ciola, again, everyone was talking about the Oaks, the Guineas, the whole works, being the dark horse for all of these races. Um, after such a promising debut, looked a really good horse when winning at Sandown. Um, looked very, very smooth. Was disappointed last time out um, behind Diamond Rain. There's no getting away from that. But like I said, 
they're learning on the job. They do different things. Step up in two furlongs. And you're looking at 14 to 1, 16 to 1. James Doyle switching in for the ride from um, Kieran True Market. I see that as a positive. Um, so again, we are swinging. Uh, and But at the, at the end of the day, as I've said time and time again, Phillies and Mayors races, John Goslin and Aidan O'Brien, the best in the business. Not saying that they'll win every race because they won't, but they do outrun their prices. And when they've got the favourites and stuff, they are very interesting. The other one that I've gone for, which is a big swing in my opinion, was 16 to 1, which was Ruby's Are Red. People were giving this horse outsider chances for the um, the Oaks, but she never handled the track at Lingfield, and then she was even worse at Epsom. But despite that, she's shown plenty of promise. When she finished in behind You Got To Me, she finished actually finished ahead of Danielle, despite not handling the track and being about 10, 10 lengths behind turning in at Lingfield. So... Again, at 14 to 1, I thought it was fair. One at a big price that I haven't actually backed myself was Lava Stream. And, but this was purely on last run. A horse that's more exposed than many of these. But Bolsena got first run on her last time in a race where it was all about C just in time being sent off 1 to 2. Um, but unfortunately, C just in time was just, <laughs> C just, in time was just a complete no-show. So it was, Bol- was Bolsena that ended up getting the job done. Uh, sorry, Bolsena didn't get the job done. She should have got the do- job done, but she didn't. So, and then we move on. We move on to um, none other than Kiprios returning. Marmite horse at the moment. Some people are saying, obviously, six to four. Um, they're saying it's too short. He's not his 2022 form. Other people are saying that um, he won't bounce back to it. And then some people are saying, well, he's not had the chance. He's growing into his racing. Aidan O'Brien will have him prime. Um, and this is all about the day. Me, I'm somewhere in between. I put this horse up at four to one anti post uh, just after Cheltenham to all the subscribers, and the words were pretty simple. It was if you want the horse that's going to shorten in the market and you want him on side, then take the four to one on Kiprios, because it just leaves you in a position now where you've got the horse at six to four. If you if you've put say ten pound on it, you're going to get forty if he wins. If you don't like him and you want to have ten pound on four other horses and get your money back if um. If he wins the race, then that's fine. If you if you want to lay him off and get your stake back, you get, there's so many angles you can play because you've got the favourite on side. It's just a no lose really. You can you can lay the whole lot off and make a profit. You can lay it off, take your stake out. You can do whatever you want. For me, for Kiprios, I'm somewhere in between. I do think he is the absolute goat of the staying division. Um, and even his run against Trawlerman last year, I think even that would put him close in here. But his his runs over twenty furlongs. So this is this is a ultimate stairs trip. So this is two mile four furlongs. Um, his his run over the twenty furlong trip, um, which was I think he's done it. Was it Royal Ascot? Yeah, Royal Ascot, and also obviously at Longchamp. And his two they're two of his best runs. The run at Longchamp over, on very soft ground, he ran to a queer best one two eight RPR. For context, I mean you're looking at Gregory. Even if he runs to one one twenty, like all the other horses in this race they've Gregory's got nowhere near that um Trawlerman did it once when beating Kiprios and Vorban ran to 119 last year and Coltrane who obviously sets the standard in these sort of races his best is 119 so Kiprios doesn't even have to run to his best a quick flick through obviously these last two prep runs they're preps at the end of the day but before that three of his four runs he ran to 120 124 and 128 so like you can say what you like his form is in the book and as we've seen with Aidan O'Brien August Rodan Illinois like all his horses are peaking this week and I would expect this horse to run a monster of a race so even if I had no bet in the race I'd still have him on side at 6 to 4 um it's easy to make a phone, uh, it's easy to make a case for um plenty of these in the race and many people this is a brilliant race for betting like many people are going to take two or three stabs against him because if he bombs you're getting a big price on almost everything else in the race um gregory's not one that i've ever really warmed to uh trawler man um he was only finished three and a half lengths behind tower of london out in maidan he obviously beat kiprios but that was a brilliant frankie de Toy ride um he's got his headgear on he has his chance, but I just think the discrepancy is not big enough for me. Um, for a horse that's clearly got issues um, at times, it'd be interesting to see the fact that it's interesting that William Buick's been switched um, back across um, and Kieran Schumacher's been removed from that ride. So Buick's definitely, I'd definitely rather, I'd fear Buick more than I would Kieran Schumacher. So anyway, let's cut to the chase. The other horse that I like is Vorban. Vorban, obviously he's a two mile uh, champion hurdle horse um, on, over the uh, jumps. 
but you can't get his win out of your head at Ascot this time last year in the Copper Horse Handicap. Yeah, he was running off a mark of 101, but he ran to 119 that day. It was over a shorter trip, um, but he was sent off the, uh, what price was he sent off? 92 for the Melbourne Cup. And that's over two miles. Like he's He has got to prove that he stays this further trip. Um, and he is a strong type, a strong traveling, exuberant type. But there's absolutely nothing to say he won't. And I just think if there's a horse that can absolutely blow this to bits, then it could be him. Um, he's currently around the seven to one price, and he's the other horse that I'd have on size. Kiprios would be the main. Say if we were talking points, Kiprios would be two, and Vorban would be one. That'd be how I'd play the race. Obviously, I've backed Kiprios at four to one, so I've also just backed Vorban. Um, haven't got a selection in the five oh five, um, five forty. Um, <laughs> The, the horse that I like is the same as everyone else. I put him up a few days ago at five to two. He's now in six to four. Six to four could look a big price afterwards. It may look a silly price afterwards. Um, against his rivals, first look. Um, if you're going on form, he's, his form's head and shoulders above the favourites. Um, he finished second in the Prickster Jockey Club uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but that was on very soft ground. The race kind of fell apart. And also low draws were favoured. And he was in a low draw. He also finished behind Darlinghurst. Um, that sort of form marks might are strong, but again, it's all on softer ground. Um, so I would have question marks, but at the same time, Andre Favre doesn't send him just for the sunshine. So it'd be no surprise for him to run a big, big race. Bracken's laugh obviously beat King's Gambit last year, but I would just expect that King's Gambit's improved from uh, that run. Um, Bellum Justum is interesting. Um, obviously finishing behind City of Troy was slightly fancy for the derby, but I just think King's Gambit, this obviously is goes back to the... Uh, London Gold Cup form. He won the London Gold Cup with any amount in hand. He's gone up from a mark of 93 up to 107. So it's completely knocked him out of handicaps. Um, and he absolutely bolted up there. And as I said, that is normally one of the best handicaps um, of the season. The Connection has won this race with Time Test, having won the uh, December Gold Cup. They've also turned down decent, like big, big sums of money to um, have this horse go to Japan or uh, elsewhere. Um, so King's Gambit is the one that I like in this race. So a quick summary for day th three. Uh, Whistle Jacket and Shareholder in the 230. The 305, Pony Ross and Gilded Water. But I've had a saver on French Duke. Regards Pony Ross, obviously I'm mentioning the Gold London Gold Cup. I wouldn't put you off a Pony Ross double with um, King's Gambit. Because obviously if he wins and he's... Um, he finished behind him it's a good form boost I've took three swingers in the 345 we've gone Rubies are red Ciola and Danielle uh, 425 hoping to see Kiprios and Vorban finish 1-2 and then finally 540 Kings Gambit hopefully to round off the day with a victory so I am going to cut that short. I know I said I'm going to do them all what I'm going to do is do this will be day three and then I'll do day four in a different YouTube Thank you very much and good luck.